at home, who is so caring. But we have uh, a unique person who uh, survived a horrible event. And later on, with uh, time going on, we learn more and more about the struggle, not only uh, her own struggle, but the uh, struggle of so many Jews from Eastern Europe who uh, were exposed to, uh, literally, to extinction. My brother is writing uh, his own um, reflections in the book. The book is written the way that um, a mom's story dominates and leading us through the book. And we are reflecting as uh, children of Holocaust survivors. What I value about uh, our mother that uh, she truly was very careful, careful about talking about the Holocaust in front of us. When I think about retrospectively, uh, I, I, I feel that she was so wise already in that stage of her life to realize that she would do plenty of damage to us. Psychologically, you just imagine that there, instead of living in a town with 800 Jews, small town, 8,000 people living in a town. Uh, after the war, there are only two families. Mm. Uh, each family, uh, four members. Mm. Mother, father, and two children. And um, those two families were representing the, the rest of the Jews who survived from the town. And I think that if she would talk too much about uh, her stories, we would be so confused living in a communist regime which was hiding everything, uh, entire future. And uh, communist historians were changing uh, entire truth, what actually happened. On top of it, being Jew at that particular time meant not having any support, not having any Synagogue, not having any rabbis, not having any Jewish friends. So I appreciate, I, I do appreciate that she was hiding all the pain. Occasionally only, what you will also read in the book, we heard her, her cry and they were confused. Um, we didn't know what is causing it because not having knowledge about the truth obviously leading to confusion. Mother is uh, the, uh, the cornerstone of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the certainty. She's supposed to give us uh, the safety. And she was giving it to us. But at the same time, we realized that there is a certain weakness in her and we were not able to understand it. And I can talk and talk uh, there is so much written about those issues in the book. Yeah. So Peter, what changed in her? Or when in her story did things change? She mentioned in the film that people came to interview her when they were writing their theses. When did she become so certain that it was time to speak and time to tell her story? The first time... Uh, um, uh, Paul experienced in his school, I don't know Paul how you old were at that time, maybe 14, 13. Uh, my mom came to his uh, school and uh, she started to talk about Holocaust in front of uh, his friends and Paul was just shocked. He's writing about his experience uh, in the book. We saw that mom uh, has more and more willingness to share with a purpose her story to let those young people to know what actually happened and what should be the response of all of us towards something horrible like Holocaust happening to anybody. Gradually, um, 
later on when I was analyzing, and it takes so much reflection on analyzing when you analyze uh, a mother as well as a survivor, and observing the entire her life, how it's evolving, uh, how it is changing, how it is becoming more and more meaningful. Um, I realized that her strength uh, was uh, turning to uh, uh, her only weapon, which is uh, responding to Holocaust with the pure love of others. And it was amazing. I, I, you, you don't realize it when you live through, the, uh, through that experience, but later on, when you get older and you're not mature, that you can objectively reflect on that time when she was losing love, she was using justice, she was using compassion, she was using uh, truthfulness. All these values which Rabbi Spansky is teaching us during the Torah study, by the way, you should come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a true, truly miracle. And I think that it was the only way how to overcome that personal, psychological, physical tragedy what the Holocaust uh, left inside, in the soul of Holocaust survivors. So speaking of Torah, uh, this week's parasha, parasha Bo, includes the description of the plague of darkness. Let me read, I think it's just one or two verses. <clears throat> then the Eternal One said to Moses, Hold out your arm toward the sky, that there may be darkness upon the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be touched. Moses held out his arm toward the sky, and thick darkness descended upon all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another, and for three days no one could move about. So in the original description, this is not rabbinic interpretation or midrash, this is in the original Torah description of this plague of darkness. It was so dark that not only could you not see one another, not only could you not discern a human face right in front of you, a face representing, standing for the image of God, but it was a crippling kind of darkness. It was so thick that you could not move. You physically could not move to act. And that's the kind of darkness that overtook so much of the world in the years leading up to the Shoah and throughout. The kind of darkness when you cannot see the humanity in a fellow human being and the kind of darkness that makes you frozen, that cripples you, so you cannot move to action and therefore anything, any evil becomes possible. So Peter, you often turn to the metaphor of light and darkness. And I wonder now, at this stage of your life, when you uh, take all the teachings that your mother taught you and you know what you know of Holocaust history, um, where do you look for moments of light, for hints of light? And I will mention that today, of course, was Rosh Chodesh, the first sliver of the new moon. So even on this International Holocaust Memorial Day, we have a glimmer of hope and reason to look for renewed light for humanity and all the world. My friends uh, from, uh, from your Torah, Torah studies uh, knew about uh, the presentation. And they probably uh, uh, saw a little bit uh, um, of my struggle. And uh, in my discussions uh, with them, many of them gave me very good advices. Uh, one example, um, when I said to Jerry, 
Jerry, please, can you advise me if I get so emotional and I, I, I'll be not able to control myself, what shall I do? And she's, uh, she said, just push your tongue uh, towards the top of your mouth. And she's a nurse. Uh, she's a nurse, so she must be right. I still don't need it, but when you see me doing it, you know that I'm pretty close. <laughs> Uh, the most dearest uh, advice came from uh, um, Cynthia uh, Good, uh, and 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 it's it's really uh, I, I don't know if Cynthia is here, but yes, yes, yes. Cynthia, I tell you honestly, the name of yours, that Good, is exactly how you're supposed to be named. Yeah. Named, and reason is uh, uh, she came to she came she approached me and she said, Peter, so. Are you ready for the presentation? And I look at her and I said, Cynthia, I probably will never be ready for this presentation. And she said, why? And I said, there is so much darkness and I'm searching for light, I, I can't find it. Can you help me? And she turned to me and uh, she said, you are the light and I am a light and all of us what you see around, these are, these are those people who are carrying the light with them to the future. And I thought about it and I said, wow, I have to give you up. This is exactly what I needed. I'm ready for the presentation. And then I thought, and there is much more light in our life. And there is the light of Israel. Lloyd, I'm going to tell the story. Oh, which one? You know that. I was a fresh member of this synagogue. And when you are a fresh member of this congregation, obviously it's a so big congregation, so many people come and leave and come. And I was searching for somebody who I can talk with. And Lloyd, uh, he was much younger at that time. <laughs> Now I feel like 35. <laughs> and uh, I approached him, uh, I introduced myself, and long, uh, Lloyd obviously expressed his interest to talk to me. And then, following Shabbos, I approached him again, and I said, Lloyd, I need your advice. I really need your advice. Well, I can advise you. What do you need from me? Lloyd, you wouldn't believe I had a dream. The entire family including my mother, who is 80, 87, will all of us will fly to Israel. And it will be my first flight to, to Israel. And I said, you know, I still have a little bit doubt about it because I just don't know how can I approach my mother? How can I, how can, how can I persuade her to do it with us? Actually, before I end this part of the story, I woke up early in the morning a few days prior to that. I turned to my wife and I said, Evie, I had a dream. <coughs> I, I, I had a dream that all of us, we have to fly to Israel with my mother, entire family. And uh, my wife is always enough rational to persuade me that it, it's a little bit overwhelming, that I should a little bit rationalize what I'm saying. Maybe you should go with your brothers and with your mother and make it a little bit more meaningful for all of you that you'll be together. I said, wow, my wife is really pretty smart. <laughs> yes. I know. <laughs> and um, so I'm talking about Israel. And I have to tell you something. You, all of you probably uh, have that experience of coming to Israel the first time in your, in your life. And I tell you, this experience will never will be deleted from my, from my heart, from my soul, from I should love God with all my heart, I should love God, God with all my soul. soul and with all my might. So that's exactly what happened. I felt like if I was searching for a land, which is more than land, which is everything what means 
to belong to my heart and to my soul, I found it there. And uh, hopefully Paul will have a chance to talk about it because he's one of the readers. And his choice was also talking about our experience with our mother visiting Israel first time. So I have one more question for you before we turn to the next part of our program, which is to hear excerpts from the memoir. Uh, and that is, um, Peter, you were called to the Torah as a bar mitzvah for the first time. How many years ago now? It was exactly 27th of uh, February. I would love to say 27th of January, but I, We're close. I can't. We're close. <laughs> and um, it was uh, 27th of February. How many years? I never ago? forget, Rabbi, I never forget when, when the first time Lindy was teaching me how to uh, chant from Torah. And I turned to Lindy and I said, Lindy, are you really serious? that I have to do it exactly how you want? Me, who entire life uh, uh, was inspired by improvising, and now I have to do it exactly, and she said, Peter, just listen. You are going to do exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> you said it better. <laughs> so, it became a very memorable day, and um, can I, can I tell you another story about Benny? He's, he's not here, so I can say it. <laughs> so, Benny Meisner is in, Benny Meisner is in, Ger is in Germany yeah. participating in a very important Holocaust Memorial concert. We'll be hearing a lot about it when he returns. So, um, uh, I, I discussed this issue with Linda. I said, Linda, I would love to play my composition, which I dedicated to my mom, uh, at the end of the service. And Linda looked at me and said, Peter, you have to talk to Benny. I said, Benny? I don't know how. You will manage, you will manage. So it happened. Um, we had a rehearsal. Benny came, it was just me and Benny. And I successfully um, chanted from the Torah, he was very satisfied, and then it came to the hurdle, further. I said, Benny, I just have one wish and I want to share it with you. I just want to play at the end of the service the composition which I composed for my mother. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Peter, I'm so sorry, but uh, if I allow it to you to do it, then I have to allow everybody to do it. And it was so rational. I said, Benny, this makes sense what you're saying. But. <laughs> I said, Benny, uh, listen, listen to the music first, and then I'll, 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 I'll tell you the story. So he was sitting in a main sanctuary, and I was playing the music for him. And after finishing the music, he came to me and, and he said, Unbelievable. I saw that you'll, you'll play some polka or something. <laughs> And I, I turned to Ben and I said, Benny, okay, now you know the song, now I'm going to tell you the story. So this song, this, this music is dedicated to my mother. When my mother passed away, I was sitting by her bed with my wife. And in a certain moment, my wife turned to me and uh, she, looked at the, she was looking at the, at the hand and, and at my, my mom's hand, and she said, Do you see the number? I said, Yeah, I, I know that number. 2146. She, she said, Yeah, but look at the number again. I said, I don't know. And she said, What day is today? I said, 21st. Which month? Fourth. And which member of her fa of my mom's is the last member of your family? My mom, six, six members of my family. So I'm telling uh, I'm telling Benny this story, and Benny speechless, and um, and he he turned to me and he said, Peter, I will allow you to play that music. 
but with one condition that you will allow me to introduce the music. And he did it. And it was amazing. I tell you, he was introducing the music so passionately and on entire story that I was sitting there ready to play. And I, I just, I, I, I knew that I'm ready. That I'm ready. So this is a story. Uh, did I answer your question? <laughs> I actually didn't have a chance to ask the question. <laughs> But um, thank you for sharing that story with us because at the conclusion of our evening, we will be able to hear that melody, that composition that Peter dedicated to his mother. Is your permission? <laughs> so this is my question, Peter. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how it felt to be finally called to the Torah by your name, Eliezer ben Shlomo Velea. Coming to the synagogue and experiencing those bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs is just an uh, overwhelming feeling of joy and true joy. And I always sit with Lloyd and we always feel the unbelievable certainty that there is a continuity. That there is a continuity. And when I when I saw those boys there, I said to myself, I see myself there. I see myself so there. And you feel that pain in your heart that unfortunately did not happen to me. And for some reasons which I have to admit that I don't remember exactly oh, I know now. <laughs> Um, six months before my mom passed away, I said to her, the mommy, I decided to have a bar mitzvah. And she was a little bit astonished, obviously. I was already 62, 60, 63 when it happened, which means that exactly 50 years late. But, um, the, the experience gave me the sense of belonging and appreciation of what the synagogue is giving me. And I tell you honestly, Rabbi, I will never forget those experiences. Experiences uh, being with you and being with uh, all my friends. And uh, I don't know if I should call it home, if, if I should call it a uh, divine place which gives me meaning to be closer to God. But definitely it's a mixture of everything. It's a friendship. It's um, giving me a chance to be close, closer to the divine forces, to the layer of knowledge about God, which not too many synagogues can give me, and not too many teachers can give me. And you are one of them, definitely, which I so much appreciate. And you give me the sense of uh, not knowing, <laughs> which I love, and um, I look forward to to be student, your student, and I hope that you you continue with your brilliant teaching skills. And what was your mother's response when you told her of your intentions? My uh, mother was always a little bit worried about me, um, and and I will read for you uh, from the book uh, some of uh, her responses. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll leave it for the moment. Uh, Let's turn to the book. Okay. okay. We're going to turn to excerpts from the memoir Daisy. Before I even start, I want to show you a, a picture um, of a uh, writer and very good friend of my mom. Just give me a second. Uh, her name is Tetsana uh, Diova. She's a journalist. 
And as a journalist, uh, she uh, always she always uh, have those opportunities to uh, to see interesting people with interesting stories. I will find a picture of her and my my mom. Just if you don't mind, give me a second. Uh, can I have it? one, two, three, four? <laughs> um, and the picture is uh, uh, let me find the picture. Helen, uh, uh, picture. Above, above the uh, here it is. Yeah, here So this is a picture of uh, the writer and my mom. And um, Lindy will be reading uh, the, the, from the book the text uh, of the writer describing her experiences. You are late, Helen said to me disapprovingly when I gradually approached her. I have already said everything today. I am tired, she continued looking at me curiously through her big glasses. She looked like a little sparrow, yet she had a strict face, facial expression, and her voice literally thundered. Helena surprised me with so much boldness in such a small woman. She indicated to me that I missed my opportunity to listen to her story. As a journalist, I often ran against time, and I tried to be in multiple places at once. Doing so is sometimes almost impossible. I am connected daily with unexpected events, listening to hundreds of incredible human stories. Helena's story was one of them. But something was very different. I remember our first meeting, just like it was yesterday. I squatted down as she was sitting in her wheelchair, and I touched gently her hand. It was warm, full of wrinkles and lifelines. For a moment, she looked at me suspiciously. Then her gaze suddenly softened. She had large, brown, sparkling eyes, narrow lips, and a beautiful pointed nose. All right, wait a minute, she said with a little measured voice. In just that moment, we looked into each other's eyes. Two strange women who had no idea how close to each other they would become. I pushed her on the wheelchair into one of the empty classrooms. We sat opposite each other, just two of us. So, ask me, what would you like to know? She said to me, and then she started telling me her story again, like she would so many times later in her life. As I was listening intently and watching Helena, suddenly I saw in her the young girl drifting around in mud and filth, imprisoned between tall barbed fences of a concentration camp hearing the screams of moaning bodies. She walked helplessly in the middle of the winter with bare feet tucked into hard wooden clogs, the long hours standing frozen in the rain, numb without the ability to feel anything, condemned to death. I felt the bitterness that does not want to leave. It is like when one wants to take a deep breath but cannot, and then an exhale finally comes out emptying the weakness. Her memory was razor sharp. Nobody can imagine, nobody can understand what a person can survive, and suddenly she began to cry. She sobbed for a while, and then for a moment she fell into silence. She pulled out a cotton handkerchief from her gray trousers and while wiping tears, she continued to talk. Never again, she pleaded. Her memories from the camp poured out like ocean waves. She could not stop. For nearly 30 years, she has been treated for the trauma she had experienced. Mm -hmm. Helena knew and feared that a similar atrocity could be repeated at any time. She knew that just one small spark of hatred is enough to suddenly become a flame which will burn and destroy everything. No more, she pleaded. In the first years after the camp, any human goodness was so difficult
for her to accept. I want to ask uh, Janet, uh, who helped us so much uh, this translation of uh, entire book, uh, including the help of my brother Paul, who took the responsibility to uh, translate it. Janet, would you be so kind and can you read uh, part of uh, my mother? I just want to say thank you very much to both Peter and Paul for asking me to speak and to actually read their mom's part. It really did touch my heart when I was translating it and uh, just what an incredible woman she was. So for me, this was a great honor to actually read her words. So I wanted to, I, Peter did pick a part for me to read, but I asked if I could pick it up another part as well um, that and for me this really really did touch me so we humans are good bad lazy hard-working everyone is his own kind I do not understand why we are able to hurt each other only for being different just because someone has another religion nationality or skin color <coughs> It is a big injustice on mankind. I am saddened that we allowed this to go so far. In the concentration camp, they killed my parents and my brothers. Despite my very painful memories, I decided to talk about what I went through and what I had to do to survive. There are those among us who shut their memories off forever because they did not have the strength to share them. I consider it my responsibility to testify to other generations what happened, because far and wide, I am the only one left from the second Slovak transport. I believe it was destiny. I survived to pass my story to others. I beg you, never let anything like this happen again. I stayed Jewish, and I'm proud of it. Helena Weinborn. Thank you, Jeanette. I'm going to read the other part. <coughs> the situation in Czechoslovakia had changed, and good inter interpersonal relationships were over. After the Nazis entered Austria in March 1938, we experienced increased danger and propaganda of hatred. We woke up every morning into an uncertain world. The proclamation of autonomy of the Slovak disrupted our human coexistence when the witch hunt began in Slovakia for Czechs, the Jews, and for so many so-called enemies of the emerging authoritarians. So, of the authoritarian Slovak regime. I was just a child. I did not understand anything. But bad news came at us from everywhere, and they did not forecast anything good. At 